morning. How y'all doing? Doing super, thanks for asking. Uh, open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 6, please, and thank you. Lost the cap to my pen. No, it's good. Shut up. No, that's all right. Here. See, it's broken, so it, it's no good to me. I don't want it anymore. <laughs> thanks, brother. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, uh, you can raise your hand. Dan's got a handful of them back there, and he'll get one to you. And uh, you can open to Isaiah 6, and then we'll head uh, after that to Mark. As we continue uh, with our Gospel of Mark series, Faith in Action. Isaiah 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple... Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, here am I, send me. What a beautiful and awesome picture it is of the glory of the Lord filling the presence uh, of wherever he is, in this case, uh, where Isaiah sees this vision, and uh, the servants, the seraphim, flying around. And, and the only natural reaction for a human being to be in the presence of a holy and perfect God is to say, woe is me. Now, when you and I say woe, we're like, oh, it's so sorrowful, oh, it's so bad. When they say woe in the Bible, it means death. Death to me, because I am a man of unclean lips. I am a sinner in the presence of a holy and perfect God, and I come from a people that are a bunch of sinners, and I should be struck dead right here and now. But that doesn't happen. Because of God's grace, because of his great love, he takes away Isaiah's sin and calls him into ministry, the work of the Lord. Now, it, just because Isaiah is a prophet and he answers this call doesn't mean that it's only prophets, priests, pastors, professionals in ministry. Everybody that God touches, everybody that God uh, takes away their sin, everybody that God calls into a right relationship with him is commissioned to go. As he says, whom shall I send? Here am I, send me. Um, and we take that verse and we go, oh, that's so great, that's so wonderful that you know, God would choose this person and God would choose me to, to go into ministry and to, and to preach his word. And we, as often happens in, as humans, uh, we, we read that verse and we stop and go, oh, that's just so great. Here am I, send me, Lord. And, and we skip the next verses. And he said, go and say to this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull, and their ears heavy, and their blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. And you can read that and go, man, what a wicked God. He sends this prophet to these people to harden their hearts, to turn them away from him. Because we miss out on the nuances of the word. And the word is Isaiah. I mean, Isaiah wrote that, and he's quoting God. God called him, go preach the word. And Isaiah's thought is, that's great. You know, I'm in the presence of a holy God. You're calling me. I'm blessed. This is wonderful. But I might as well be, you know, spitting in the wind because I'm going to preach this word and I know the people. Their, their ears are going to be closed to it. Their hearts are going to be hardened. Um, but I'm going to go and do it, God. And it's a bittersweet irony that you've called me to do this, um, but the people won't hear, the people won't listen.
We want, in all things, especially in America, first world problems, we want instant gratification. We want things and we want them now. When, when we're called to Christianity, when we're called to a relationship with God, when we're called to share our faith, we want to see people respond when we share it with them. And it doesn't always work that way. In fact, statistics will say that a person needs to hear the gospel five to seven times before they'll have a response to it. But we, we want to see God glorified. We want to see the word spread. We want to see the kingdom grow. And yet, it doesn't always work the way we want it to. Now, flip over in your Bibles to uh, Mark chapter 4, because we're going to see what Jesus says about the growth of the kingdom. We'll, we'll get back to, we'll cover the part in, in chapter 3 as well, but uh, we're going to get to uh, number 4, or chapter 4 here first. Okay, before I start talking about what Jesus said, though, let me, let me lift this up to him. Father God, thank you for your love for us, your great love, that even though what we really deserve is death, um, because of your grace, because of your mercy, you don't give that. You, you hold it off. You with, withhold your wrath on the sinful people in hopes that they might turn, in hopes that they would open their eyes and their ears and hear and perceive and understand your great love, your great mercy, your forgiveness that you offer through your son, Jesus Christ. And Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for Mark and his gospel and the, the recording of the things that Jesus said and did. We saw him put faith in action as we saw your kingdom grow in the first century. May we see it grow today, Lord, with your blessing. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh, chapter 4, we cover some parables here. We're not going to go through each of these, not going to read them each, just cover them briefly and see what they tell us about uh, reaction to the gospel, because that's what we're talking about today, reaction to the gospel, to the kingdom, okay? Uh, first off, he starts teaching in parables here, and, and, and we'll see why in a moment, but um, first one he tells is the parable of the sower, and if you don't know this, it's right there, Mark chapter 4, verse 1, uh, and continuing, and, and basically, the people gather around, and Jesus is a teacher, and parables are uh, everyday stories about normal things, but they have a hidden spiritual meaning, okay? That's basically a parable. If I told you a story about something that happened to me in life, uh, something that you could relate to, but there's a deeper spiritual meaning, that's a parable. Parables uh, are pretty much restricted to Jesus because he was the king, <laughs> right? And he's the best at them. So he tells this parable of the sower, and he says, look, a, a, a sower went to sow seeds in the field. Now, for you and me, when, when we think of seeds, right, we, we get our little egg crates and we put the potting soil in there and we put one or two seeds, whatever the package says, and we get them growing up and then we transplant them out in the garden or we make these nice furrows and, you know, three seeds every six inches if you want to get the right amount of corn and you, you plant these seeds just so. But back then, they did what was called broadcast sowing. And so they would just take a handful of seeds and throw it everywhere. Like if you fertilize your lawn with one of those little spreader things, and the seeds go everywhere, that same type of thing, okay? Uh, so he says, look, a man is sowing in his field, and some of the seeds go here, and some go there, and some go everywhere. And so the parable of the sower is, is that this guy throws seeds everywhere, and some lands on the road and gets eaten by birds, and some lands on rocky soil and doesn't get a very good uh, bite into the ground, and so it withers and dies, and some gets sown among the weeds, and so as it starts to come up, the weeds start to choke out those plants and they die. But some makes it to the good soil. And in that good soil, it grows and it sprouts and it produces a harvest, 30, 60, and 100 fold, uh, which is a lot. By the way, a 100 fold harvest is a ridiculous amount. Uh, but this is the way Jesus taught, right? Hyperbole. And he says, This is what the kingdom is like. And then this one he explains to his disciples, his closer people. Um, because he knows that not everybody's ready to receive all the truths of the kingdom. And so he tells these parables. But to his disciples who have followed him, he says, here's what it means. Uh, when you start going and preaching the word, uh, Satan's going to snatch some of it away right away. You know, I mean, their hearts are going to be hardened. You're going to say, uh, Jesus died for your sins. And they're going to say, Jesus is, pfft, God's dead. You know, don't tell me that garbage. And then you're going to sow some, and some people are going to go, wow, I went to church today, and I heard this message about Jesus, and it was so excited, and it was wonderful, and, and, um, and things were just great and everything. Um, but then, you know, oh, well, they forgot my name the second time I showed up at church. So forget it. My faith's not very deep. 
uh, my car ran out of gas on the way home. God should have blessed me, even though I drove for 16,000 miles on that last gallon of gas. <laughs> so their, their faith is not strong, it's not deep, and so they turn away. And, and then some, you know, they, they do. They come to church, they hear the gospel, they think, this is great, I can really do this, um, but they still got bills to pay, and uh, they still got people to see, and they still got a job to do, and then they got the wife and the kids, or the husband and the kids, and they got all these things going on, and they don't have time to get to church, they don't have time to have Christian relationships to help grow their faith and, and grow strong, and they don't have time to read the Bible, and all the things of the world take them away from their faith, and so they turn and fade away, just like the weeds choke out that plant. But some, some hear the word and realize just like Isaiah, woe is me, I should be dead, but God has called me, God has saved me through his son Jesus Christ, and, and reading my Bible and spending time with Jesus is more important than watching that show on TV, and having a good relationship with my family is more important than uh, my other hobbies, and everything else is secondary to God and the relationships that he calls me to be into, and, and those are the lives that we see, those are the, the, the mature Christians whom you just look at and you go, wow, I, I want some of that, that's just how do, how do they do that? And being the mature Christians who are deep in their faith, they'll say, it's not me, it's him. And so he continues with these parables, and he says, you know, hey, a lamp under a basket, right? When, when you become a Christian, it, it's not you. It's a personal relationship with God, but it's not something that you keep to yourself. You don't light a, a lamp and put a shade over it, a dark shade that hides the light. Just like when you become a Christian, you don't hide your faith. You share it. You make it shine for all to see. And then he talks about how a seed grows. The farmer plants it, and he waters it, and eventually something happens, and it pops up out of the ground, and it grows into this plant. The farmer doesn't know how that happens. He just knows, hey, I'm supposed to plant it and water it, and God makes those things grow. And Jesus says, this is what the kingdom is like. You do your work that God calls you to do, and God will make, make it grow. God does the heavy lifting. God causes his kingdom to grow. So it might not happen the way you want it, right quick uh, because God's doing things in his time and that is frustrating right <laughs> but then he talks about the mustard seed now a mustard seed uh, you, you know we say it's the smallest seed well you know I think we can know now examining more of the world that there are smaller seeds than the mustard seed but when you said it in first century Palestine a mustard seed to those people that meant a very small thing Right, like if I were to say uh, a nanobite or or a micro machine, you know, oh, that's a small thing, right? So if I Jesus says you take a mustard seed, and they're like, oh, this is a very small thing that he's talking about, right? The smallest thing grows into this plant that birds can live in. That's the way the kingdom is. It starts small, but in its time, God will do the work, and this thing will grow. And so he tells these things, and in verse uh, 33 and 34, it says, With many such parables he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples he explained everything. So as we're going through life, and as we are uh, being Christians and sharing the word, and we're making disciples through a variety of means, um, that may be classes on Sunday morning, that may be small groups, that may be one-on-one -on -one meetings. However, uh, God is working in our lives to make disciples. We're going to encounter a variety of reactions from people as we live our lives, uh, not as a lamp hidden, uh, but as a sower of seeds, spreading them everywhere. And God's going to make some of those grow, some of them will not. So we're going to encounter this variety of reactions, and this is what we're looking at today, the reactions uh, to the gospel. When you do the work in God's kingdom, uh, tilling the soil, planting the seeds, watering, fertilizing, all these things, you wait for God to ripen the fruit because he's the one that's doing it. Um, but your job is to sow the seeds, to do the work. His job is to grow it. So let's look at five reactions we can encounter, and now we'll back up to um, verse 7 of chapter 3. Okay? The first reaction is excited, and, and this week I actually have filled in the blanks on your bulletin, so if you uh, want those... Um, you can fill those in. Jesus withdrew with his disciples. This is Mark chapter 3, verse 7. Withdrew with his disciples to the sea, and a great crowd followed from Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem and Idumea and from beyond the Jordan and from around Tyre and Sidon. When the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him, and he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him. For he had healed many, so that all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him, 
And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. And he strictly ordered them not to make him known. Uh, so when we start doing these things, we look at this, all right, Jesus uh, began his ministry. God called him to preach the word to all the towns. Uh, he's the Messiah. Some of the signs of the Messiah are that demons were cast out, that people were healed, uh, eyes were opened, ears were opened, uh, all these things. And so the things that he's doing, the people see, and, and they're like, wow, that's awesome. He's, he's healing these people. He's casting out. He's freeing people from demonic oppression. He's doing all these things. And, and we see in this map here what that looked like. You, you may not be able to see it, and I forgot my laser pointer, so I'll have to do a PowerPoint. You guys ready? Up there in the north, <laughs> Sidon, Tyree, the little lake thing in the middle is the Sea of Galilee. That's where he's at. That's the lake, okay? And he spent most of his time on the western side, but he went over to the eastern side as well, to Decapolis, right? The other side of the sea. And then down here, Judea, that's where Jerusalem is. Idumea, down here, Edom, right? That's that. Beyond the Jordan, so he's talking north, south, east, west. All these people came from around. You guys remember who came to hear John the Baptist? people from Judea and Samaria. So Jesus is drawing huge crowds from all over the place because people are excited to see what he's doing. They don't care so much who he is. They want to see what's happening, right? And he's healing people and he's casting out demons and he's telling the demons, shut up. And the people are like, wow, how does he do that? That's so awesome. And we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but they're excited because people's lives are being changed. And that's what the gospel does. It changes people's lives. It takes them from death, woe is me, to life. I have eternal life in heaven with God because of my sinfulness is paid for by Jesus on the cross. And that's a free gift from God. And all you have to do is believe that Jesus died for your sins, proclaim with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. That's what the Bible says in Romans. And you will be saved. And you get to spend eternity in heaven with God. And you have to put up with some stuff here, but it's a lot easier to put up with stuff here and now when you realize this is just a temporary thing, um, and eternity is forever. So people are seeing this stuff, and they're excited. Now, we talk about what's going on here, right? We're, we're talking about a, a kingdom campaign to add a second building, a Christian education building, so we have more classrooms, we have more room to do more things. And some of these signs around, you'll see what they are, things that we've been thinking about God is calling us to do, to reach the community, to, to grow the saints, and to, to reach the lost. Now, I know people... Uh, in my life outside of church that don't go to church. They're probably not even Christians. And when we tell them about this, they are excited. They're like, that's great. Your church is building another building. That's awesome. Oh, that's wonderful. You're going to do all these things. The, don't come to this church. Don't go to any church. Not Christians. And they're excited because they know that people's lives are going to be changed by this. And, and I'm excited about this new building, about all the things that God's calling us to do. And how about you? <laughs> That's good. When Jesus comes into people's hearts and they are saved and they accept God's free gift of salvation and eternal life, um, it's exciting. I remember when, when I became a Christian, um, I was excited about it. I wanted people to know about it. I knew who the Christians were in my life and I'm like, hey, I'm one of you guys now, you know, and I'm giving gifts because that's my love language is to give gifts. And, and, and the only negative side of that was I was thinking, I know that you're Christians. Why have you never told me about Jesus? But it's cool because I heard about him and I know him now and, and praise God. But that's exactly what Jesus is saying about the, the lamp being hidden. You can live your life as a Christian, but you've got to tell people about Jesus too. Okay? It's an exciting thing. And that's the, one of the reactions that we get. Is people get excited about gospel change. Now the second reaction is commitment. Right? Verse 13. And he went up to the mountain and called to him those who he desired, and they came to him. And he appointed twelve, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. He appointed the twelve, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name, Lorenzus, um, that is, sons of thunder. Let me just translate that word for you. Sons of thunder is what that means, okay. Um, Andrew and Philip, and, and by the way, so this is one of the ways that we know uh, who Mark was writing to. He's writing to a Gentile audience because they, they wouldn't know that word. 
Um, so we had to translate that. And you'll see some of the, uh, the, the Hebrew or Aramaic words that people in the Greek speaking in the Roman world would not know. And so we see that, sorry. Verse 18, okay. Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew and Matthew and Thomas and James the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus and Simon the Cananean, Cananean and Judas Iscariot who betrayed him. Who's missing? Who did we meet last week? Levi, the tax collector. Remember? His name's Matthew now. He wrote the Gospel of Matthew, we believe. So he calls these people. These are 12 guys that, uh, in another one of the Gospels, it says that he called to him whom the Father revealed to him. So he went up on the mountain and prayed, Lord, who's, you know, Father God, who is uh, going to be committed to spreading the Gospel? And he identified these 12 guys. Okay, the apostles. Um, they were committed. They gave up things. They sacrificed things in their life to follow Jesus and to do his will and to spread the gospel, to, to heal, to cast out demons, to preach the word. Uh, we'll see later on as he sends them out what happens. Um, but that is another reaction as people become committed to do God's work. And they, they did a pretty good job, uh, these 12 guys. Um, they spread the word to, to the known regions of the world at that time. Uh, Eleven of them, for sure, uh, were so committed that they were put to death for their faith. They tried to kill John. They boiled him in oil, but it didn't take, and so he got exiled to the island of Patmos, and while he was there, he wrote the book, The Revelation of Jesus Christ, uh, and that's the last book in the New Testament. So um, I think he went to a ripe old age. I forget. Do you remember? Were you with him at the time? <laughs> You guys don't know who I was talking to over here. I'm just pointing over this. No, I asked I ask Frank that because he's, he's got the small group that's going through Revelation. So, um, You remember? Yeah, he, he really lived to a ripe old age. Um, uh, committed the whole time. He didn't, I mean, when, he was a young guy when he was called into service uh, with Jesus, and it, he spent his whole life doing it. So that's committed. Okay? Hey, what is it like when things are done non-committedly? That's the polite way of saying halfway there. <laughs> you ever have that coworker who, who not only has the attitude, but has the gall to actually say, you know, they pay me whether I work a little or a lot, so why work a lot? Run into that person? Are they fun to work with? Or, or is it the hummingbird who, oh, what's this? I gotta work over here. Oh, over here. And they're doing all this work and they're excited and they're committed to getting the work done and they're working hard. Which one's more fun to work with? Someone in the middle, right? That's like, <laughs> yes, I will work hard until coffee break time, and then we will take our break, and then, uh, yeah, I mean, you don't, right? We know. Um, some of those people get more done before 9 a.m. than most of us do all day, but if you're working on a team project, you want someone who's committed to it, right? So when the gospel starts moving and change starts happening in people's lives, some people will get excited, some people get committed, and they really jump in and start doing things, uh, and some people get confused. People get confused, and that's reaction number three. Uh, verse 20. Then he went home, and the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, he is out of his mind. Now, picture this, right? His family thought he's crazy and needed to come home. Obviously, there's something wrong uh, with Jesus, uh, and because he's, here's the deal. He's about 30 years old when he starts doing this, when he starts going and preaching the word. What did he do before that? He was a carpenter's son. Uh, Joseph, his stepfather, his earthly father, um, was a carpenter, and so he would have naturally followed his, his father into the family business of construction of carpentry. Um, you don't see this in the Bible, but if you know the history of the time, there's, there's a big building project going on near Nazareth, where he's from. So if you're in the construction business, man, you got lots of work. You're working hard, you're making money, right? Uh, the only thing really Mary's concerned about is that he's 30 years old, not married, because she's a good Jewish mother, and it's like, <laughs> when are you going to get married, son? I want some grandkids, right? Um, but why would he leave this, this good job and go and start preaching? He's not a trained rabbi, and really, the, the religious establishment, he's upsetting them. Why would he go start causing trouble? It doesn't make sense. And so his family's confused and think he's out of his mind, and they need to try and bring him home. Um, people don't always understand the gospel change in your life. Um, people don't understand why 
you give money to a church. People don't understand why you don't hang out with them at the bar anymore. People don't understand why you stop swearing. People don't understand why you pray for food that you bought with money that you made. People don't always understand, and they get confused. People don't always understand why we do things as a church. Some things don't make sense to people. They get confused. Um, such as when we, you know, trust God to provide when we're obedient to him. People don't always understand. Confusion uh, will often times lead to inappropriate actions, such as the fourth reaction of absurdity. Verse 22, And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebub, and by the prince of demons he cast out demons. And he called them to him and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then, indeed, he may plunder his house. Truly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man, and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying he has an unclean spirit. Okay, the beauty of my job is that I, I read the Bible a lot, and on occasions like this where I have to uh, share what I've learned, I have to actually learn stuff. And so I've learned something from this passage. Um, I, I never quite understood the strong man thing, but let me explain, okay? Um, sometimes it, it seems like our, our natural reaction to things that we don't understand are, are ridiculous. They're over the top. Um, think of uh, that email that you received. Uh, I can think of emails that I've sent uh, that not only caused confusion but caused uh, absurd reactions uh, in certain things. Um, some of those I should have never sent, but sometimes you know, I've sent them uh, abbreviated, not wanting to explain all the background uh, because it's an email and it's just like, you know, I did this. And they're like, why did he do that? What the... What, what, is, what is he, what? This is absurd, what, how? And, you know, anger builds up, but then you're like, okay, uh, here's the history. First there was X, then there was Y, then there was Z, um, and so because of those things, I took those into consideration, and I thought about all this and everything else, and that's why I did that. And, and then people are like, oh, okay. But the initial reaction is one of absurdity, and this is what we see with the scribes, okay? They're there down from Jerusalem because uh, you saw the map. I mean, he's drawn people from all over the place. He's like, you know, this uh, modern rock star, so to speak. A and people are supposed to go to Jerusalem and worship. They're not supposed to listen to this guy. He's not, even, he's not even ordained. He didn't even go to Bible college. Why are they listening to this guy, right? Um, so they attribute his power of casting out demons to Satan and, and not to God. And they actually make two charges against him. First off, that he is possessed himself. Like, he's possessed, and that's why he can do this. And then secondly, they say that he casts out demons using demonic power. And that's in verse 22. Now, in 23, he points out the absurdity. He's like, why would something attack itself? If it attacks itself, it's going to destroy itself, right? So if uh, the purpose of the demonic kingdom is to enslave humanity, and um, supposedly I'm casting out demons and therefore freeing humanity, then the demonic kingdom cannot stand, right? If, if Satan is giving me this power to cast out his other demons, I'm really attacking Satan. Why would something attack itself? That doesn't happen. But if you guys think that Satan is so strong that he is the one who's empowering me, you're wrong. Something's not going to attack itself. It's going to divide, right? A house divided cannot stand. A person divided cannot stand. A family divided cannot stand. A church divided cannot stand. A nation divided cannot stand. But if I'm doing this, and clearly it's not by demonic power, because again, that would be destroying the demonic kingdom. If I'm doing this, then this strong guy you think, Satan, he's the strong man whose house has been plundered. He's the prince of this world. And so Jesus is saying, I have come into the strong man's house. I have overpowered him. I have conquered him. He is already defeated. And now I'm plundering his house. 
I'm freeing the people that he wants to enslave. So I'm not possessed. I have the power of God on my side. And I'm not using demonic power. I've already defeated demonic power. But now you guys, if you say that I'm doing this by that power, if you're ignoring the power of God when it's right here amongst you, when you can clearly see that God is in me and Jesus claimed to be God because he was God, and obviously godly power is overcoming the demonic power, but if you're attributing godly power to demonic power, then you're blaspheming. Here's a little sticking point, right? How many of you have heard about the unpardonable sin? How many of you committed the unpardonable sin? <laughs> what sins cannot be forgiven? None, really, except one. Rejection of God. God loves you enough to provide the way to eternal life, to have a relationship with him. God loves you enough to do that, to send Jesus to die on the cross for your sins. God loves you enough to not force you to accept that, to let it be your choice. And you have the choice to reject him. And God will give you that opportunity to accept him until time's up. And so those that die rejecting God, they can't be forgiven of their sins because their life is over. So that's truly the only unpardonable sin is rejection of God's free offer of forgiveness, mercy, grace, and love. Um, not something else. So when you turn from God, or excuse me, turn from your sins and turn towards God, that's what Jesus said, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand, uh, you're forgiven, and you join the family of God. And this is reaction number five, redefinition. Verse 31, And his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside they sent to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. That is a call to discipleship, not just salvation. He's not just saying, believe in me and have eternal life. He says, follow me. And so those people who follow Jesus are doing the will of God, and they are adopted into God's family. Therefore, the family is redefined in that sense. Uh, anybody else here have a mother named Mary or a father named Bob Easter? No, and yet, if you are a Christian, if you've accepted the offer of forgiveness that God offers through Jesus Christ, you are adopted into family, and you are my brothers and sisters, and fathers and mothers. We are God's family in that respect, and so we redefine things. Um, but that's who does the will of God, the person who is adopted into God's family. Uh, that means that Jesus doesn't just say, okay, um, I died for your sins, you're forgiven, you're going to have eternal life, so just kick it here and relax until you die or I come back, whichever comes first, because that would be salvation, right? But he doesn't say that. He says, follow me. He says, make disciples. He says, take up your cross daily and follow me. Why would a person carry a cross? Because they're going to go be nailed on it. They're going to die on it. That's the call to discipleship, is a, is a dying to self, a dying to selfishness and living for Jesus, following him every day. Whoever puts their faith in action then is adopted into the family of God because you're doing the will of God. Uh, and, and I mean that by making disciples, doing what God said in the book. Okay? Uh, we believe in the gospel. When you believe in the gospel, uh, from the deepest inner part of your being, when your life is changed, when it's transformed, when you're standing like Isaiah and saying, woe is me, for I am a sinful person and I come from a sinful people. And God says, be healed, be cleansed, be forgiven. And you know that, and you turn from those things and turn towards him. That is gospel change in your life. 
Um, the gospel is exciting to some. It leads to commitment in others, confuses some, brings absurdity out of some people. But when people turn and follow God, they redefine their lives and become Christians. No matter what other people's reactions are to the gospel change in your life, because like I said, there's going to be different reactions, your job is to be obedient to the will of God. So as the band comes up and leads us into a time of celebration, let's take a look at the weekly thoughts in your bulletin there. God grows his kingdom. We are the farmers, sowing, tending the fields, and bringing in the harvest in his time. So, and the way to put your faith in action this week Again, on your bulletin there, in addition to participating in the 40 days of prayer, we've had that going on since Wednesday, the 40 days of prayer. Um, Putting faith in action. I will prepare myself for the various reactions, people's various reactions to the gospel. Uh, If they're excited, be excited with them. If they're committed, join in their commitment and, and work alongside together for the kingdom of God. If they're confused, help them to see the light as best you can. If If they act absurdly, then have grace. Uh, Look past their absurdity and and realize that God needs to do more work in their lives. And if they are redefined, then, man, hug your brother and sister. High five. Celebrate. So now is also the time when we continue our worship through receiving your gifts to God of tithes and offerings. This is how people who call Antelope Springs Church their home uh, worship God by giving back what he has blessed them with. So if you're a guest with us today, please don't feel obligated to give. Um, We're glad to have you here. In fact, you can fill out your communication card on your bulletin and take it outside to the information booth. And we got a little gift to thank you for that. But uh, all the things that we do, all the gospel change that we see in people's lives and in this community, uh, comes through these tithes and offerings. So thank you very much uh, for giving them. And uh, let me pray, and the ushers will come forward and we'll continue. Father God, thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us, this time together, Lord. Uh, thank you for the gospel, the good news that although we are sinners, you still loved us. You sent your son Jesus to pay for our sins so we could have a relationship with you, eternal life, so that we be, could be called to be partners in your kingdom and to watch you be glorified through its growth. So, Lord, as we give these tithes and offerings, we ask that you bless them and multiply them. Uh, Bless the gifts and the giver that your name may be known. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.